When you think of fighting games, what's the first game or series that comes to mind? Street Fighter? Tekken? Mortal Kombat? Maybe even Smash Brothers? What makes these particular games in this genre so popular? Is it the unique and rich selection of characters you can play, each with their own memorable signature moves and their own lore that lead to the very reason they walked into the field of battle? Maybe the well thought out gameplay and solid mechanics that make the game so addicting, which in turn manifested into intense fights that required a player's reflexes and ability to adapt against how each opponent functions, learning about matchups and weaknesses. Perhaps players had many positive and memorable experiences playing these games, whether at home, or at the arcade with pals, or in tournaments where even the players themselves take journeys to become stronger. Well, we're not playing any of them today. We're going to be playing fighting games that don't do as much of a good job, or just completely disregard the formula to what makes a good fighting game. Without beating about the bush, let's dive straight in with our first game, Rise of the Robots, specifically the Mega Drive Genesis version, because the SNES version is arguably the better version, and we don't want the better version, because that might mean having fun. The box for this game flaunts that it has music by Brian May. Wow! Brian May, the guitarist for the famous rock band Queen? Sweet! How many of his tunes do we have in this game? One. one, 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 one. Let's give it a listen, shall we? Ah! Oh, my ears! Every time I start this game up, I have to remember to turn the volume down well in advance. The music is... decent. Fitting enough for a futuristic game about fighting robots, but not all that memorable. Although if you keep playing the game repeatedly for how many times you die, then that's a different matter entirely. It's a shame when graphics are the most notable aspect of a game. For the time, this would have been considered visually striking. Definitely a lot of attention to detail and suitable for the theme of the game's world. The prologue when you begin single player mode begins with a neat looking introduction, given the Mega Drive. It's distinguishable enough. There's a ship. There's a road with tiny lines for cars. I'll give the game points though, the introduction for each enemy you're about to encounter sets the stage, giving you an idea of how formidable and powerful your opponent will be. Our first robot to take out is Loader, and all of its stats are low. Should be a piece of cake. Time to relieve this Loader of its duties. Oh. I am dead. But don't worry, this was only round one. We'll, we'll get him this time. I took how much damage? Yes, believe it or not, some enemies have special attacks that can kill you in as little as two hits. Now, Cyborg does have two special moves of their own, which the instruction manual calls the shoulder barge and the turbo headbutt, but honestly, Consider them both situational and redundant. The way you have to input them is unlike how you would input them in your average fighter. Most fighters use the more popular and simple button inputs to launch attacks. Let's use the shoulder bash for instance. The manual says away, forward, attack. You'd think you'd have to press these buttons in succession to perform the attack, but apparently that's not how it works. There's an interval between pressing one direction followed by its opposite. Nay. This is an incredibly unusual fashion to perform an attack. Even if you were to pull them off, your opponent will have already intercepted them because they're that slow and predictable. Let's see how much damage they do by practicing on two-player mode. Four hits with the shoulder barge. And four hits with the headbutt. Okay. How come my opponent can kill me with two hits with special moves that are quick and efficient, but my moves are slow and do less damage? Sometimes I get punished no matter what I do until I'm beaten into submission with little to no means of fighting back. I, on the other hand, don't get this privilege because as soon as I launch a hit on an enemy, they get knocked so far back, giving them the opportunity to win me right in my cyber six pack. And when I'm not pinned to a corner, we're just exchanging blows. What happened to a variety of moves like projectiles? More often than not, opponents constantly get the unfair advantage because of overpowered attacks. They have more range than you, and controls are as clunky as sin. After beating Loader, eventually, the next opponent is Builder, who looks like he needs a bit of a stretch. 
Oh, hang on a minute. There we go. Not really a difficult opponent as he's at a disadvantage from jump attacks. Then we have... Ugh, Crusher. I hate Crusher. In some fights, they'll leap up unexpectedly and cripple you with several attacks. You will probably die to them a lot. By the way, you die, no continues. Start over. Thankfully, the game only consists of six enemies. I'm amazed I managed to beat Crusher through a timeout. Yeah. My next opponent was military, and this was how our fight went. Next, Sentry, the security droid. He's big, he has longer legs than me, and I'm having a lot of trouble getting one single hit on him. And now I have to start again. That means I have to fight Crusher again. <laughs> so you know what you do to get past this game? You eventually find a string of moves that work against a certain foe, and repeat it until they die or lose to a timeout. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. Sometimes the game might actually play like a proper fighting game. Notice you're repeating something and then pummel you shortly after. All right, from the top, starting with loader. Jumping kick, block, punch. Jumping kick, block, punch. Jumping kick, ow! Repeat until the opposing robot is inoperable. Builder, forward jump. Keep playing slaps until he yields. Crusher. Get lucky. Military. Get in your can canning corner and can can for dear life. Hope you've got a Mega Drive controller with six buttons to do this, by the way. Sentry. Die. Start again. This is getting ridiculous. I can't believe I'm resorting to this, but I'm going on options and I'm switching the game to easy mode. The game was already on easy mode. I shudder to think how bad hard mode will be. <sighs> all right. All right. Let's go again. Loader, jumping kick, block, punch repeatedly. Builder, jumping kick and crouching punch until it submits. Crusher can be dispatched by spacing your jump kicks, but once they leap up, block, then punch, and then you have no other choice but to take punishment. Military! <laughs> Sentry, play a bit of footsie and punch him in the gut after he jumps over to you, then laugh at his face when he- After you finally get past all five enemies again, you are now up against your last opponent, the Supervisor. All right, computer, give me the analysis. How bad is it? Supervisor. All-powerful being. All stats maximized. Abilities, second to none. Weaknesses, unapplicable. Recommended course of action, give up, go home. Chances of victory are extremely slim. Well, that was easy. What happened to my screen? Did the game crash? Did, did I destroy the game by beating it? Oh, no, never mind, it's just a visual effect with an image of Cyborg. And the credits. No congratulations. No text complimenting the player on their skill or any story about how the world is finally at peace. No, just the Cyborg giving me an awkward stare while the credits roll. So, what are you up to tomorrow? If suffering through this game on single player alone isn't enough, why not have a friend join you in a totally much more fair and balanced two-player mode. Wait. No. No, this can't be right. Player 1 will always play as Cyborg, but Player 2 is the only player who has the privilege of playing as every other character, including the robots that use insane attacks that kill in two hits? All Player 1 can do is just stand there and be mocked by all of his mates! What's the matter, Jim? I thought you always wanted to be Player 1! Let's finish things off by beating Hard Mode. Step 1. Unburden your poor Mega Drive of the cartridge, throw the game in the bin, play something else. So I did end up beating it on hard mode one day, and surprisingly, you do get a little something on the credits screen. The game actually acknowledges that you beat the game on hard mode, and gives you a sequence of buttons to press on the character selection screen on two-player mode, so player two can whoop your robo buttocks as the supervisor. It was after beating hard mode that I had only just noticed on the options menu, you can actually turn the super moves off. You're given a fair fight, but... It would just be a game of exchanging basic punches and kicks. Ugh, look, the damage is already done. Let's just throw the game back in the bin and play the next one. Okay, how about a fighting game with famous basketball player Shaquille O'Neal? 
Let's start things off with story mode. Our b-ball loving protagonist is sightseeing in Tokyo when he enters a rather untidy looking dojo, where he meets presumably the elderly sensei, who warns him that a boy named Nezu is in need of saving in a land known as the Second World, and believes that Shaq is the chosen one from the stars to do this. So without question, Shaq is thrust into the total wilderness and has to face off against rather hostile inhabitants to save Nezu and stop Set Ra from wreaking havoc. Just another day in the life of Shaquille O'Neal. That aside, time for our first encounter. <laughs> the dialogue doesn't get any better, by the way. Anyway, I'll start by getting the leap on them and- Whee! That's funny, I thought we were fighting in the second world, not the bloody moon. Okay, let's look back at a majority of fighting games here. When you jump diagonally, the distance is just right. Jumping, as well as aerial attacks, are two of the methods used to take control of the playing field, and even put pressure on your opponent. But in Shaq Fu, you'd be lucky to even lay a hit on someone whenever you jump. Blocking and defending work a little differently in this game. Typically, players could just hold backwards and then attacks including projectiles would be blocked and deal a smaller fragment of damage. This isn't always the case in Shaq Fu, however. Some attacks, typically of the melee variety, can be blocked as usual. If you're feeling fancy, you can also backflip or make your fighter do a Dragon Ball Z and teleport. Projectiles, on the other hand, are a little bit complicated. Some projectiles you can nullify with a shield by holding down on the D-pad with the appropriate button, However, as to which projectiles actually get blocked this way, I thought all of the magic attacks could be blocked until this happened. Then you get projectiles like Diesel's throwing knife you can just block normally. Launching special attacks can be a pain in the neck. What's Shaquille O'Neal capable of doing anyway? Well, let's just check the manual, I'm sure it'll give me what I need. Each character also has special moves you can find out on your own. Hey, that's half the fun! Shaq's moves aren't exactly useful. Either one of his limbs is briefly set ablaze, implying a stronger attack, or he can... Shaquille? Since when did you learn to do a destructo disc? The move, named Shakuriken, isn't very good. Firstly, why is the button that performs the special attack the same button as the run command? Because of this, Shaq runs briefly, pauses, then launches the attack. It's bad enough the attack has a flashy little delay before launching it. Time is of the essence in a fighting game. If you have a move and it takes forever to be used, unless it's a really powerful one, there's next to no point in using it. You know, it's a bad sign when you have a better chance of winning using just your regular moves and abandoning special moves altogether. You're better off just, once again, resorting to... Are we starting to see a pattern, folks? You may have noticed there's a bar just below your hit points. This is called the Fury Bar, but I have no idea what it does when it's full. Maybe the instruction manual will help me out this time. Fury Bar. This pulses when your character is... Uh, is what? When my character is... What's this got to do with how the Fury Bar works? Did anyone proofread this before distributing it? You might as well just have the manual say, Sorry, we were too busy banging our heads together trying to make this game that we had to half ass our manual because we forgot half of the character's move list. Okay, so having to resort to game FAQs, I've read that the Fury Bar, when full, grants the player some additional damage for a brief period of time. But more often than not, by the time the bar builds up, you'll already be down for the count, so don't depend on it. Story mode, once again, pits you against foes, some of which have way more useful and sometimes overpowered special attacks. Some of which you'll need a fast reaction time as jumping out of the way isn't always effective. If you play the Mega Drive Genesis version, you'll come across Nezu himself, who uses a move that renders you paralyzed and unable to do anything until the projectile wears off. Beast is <laughs> ugly. Beast has a roar attack that hits almost instantaneously, and Set has a dash attack which more often than not I can't seem to dodge because jumping doesn't really guarantee safety. But after defeating Set Ra, Shark returns to his world with Nezu safe and sound, he returns to his team for the basketball match and is shocked to see Beast in the opposition. And for some reason, everyone is perfectly okay with a dangerous creature from another world who can raise soldiers from the dead to participate in a sport because he definitely won't threaten the existence of mankind, or most importantly, cheat. The end. In Duel, you can also play solo and fight foes consecutively without the story, or duke it out with a second player. But what's this? 
both players can choose whichever character they wish. Player 1 is not restricted to using Shaq. Rise of the Robots, you could learn a thing or two from this game, but this doesn't quite make up for the fact that Shaq Fu's gameplay is still lacking and unrefined. From crazy jumping to special attacks that take forever to perform, we seem to have strayed away again from the spirit of a fighting game. Right, we've beat the game, no more reason to play it, off it goes in the bin. And now for one last game, Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Based on the movie with the very same name, which by the way was not entirely accurate to Bruce Lee's real life, you play as the martial artist of Jeet Kune Do himself, pitted against sailors, angry chefs and other martial artists who seem to want him dead, which is inconvenient because he's given mirrors to protect himself from a demon which has haunted him and his father, and these mirrors serve as lives that disappear upon losing a battle. Don't lose them all, or the demon will find you. I'll commend the game for the use of screenshots from the movie. The cutscene against the sailor can be a little bit misconstrued. You'd think they were fighting over dancing with her, but in the movie... You know what, never mind. Let's just kick this guy's teeth in. And already we're off to an amazing start. I got stunned in as little as two hits, and no matter how much I mash the buttons, it's taking me forever to recover. The computer seems to counter almost every move I try to use against it. Not to mention, aerial attacks are practically useless. Occasionally, the game's hit detection will not work in your favor. Attacks can just phase right through the enemy. I took falling damage in a fighting game. It's bad enough in this game that you get stunned instantly. This is just salt to the wound. Once you've crashed onto the floor, you can try all you might to jump back up and retaliate, but sometimes you just take your sweet time to get back up. Failure is not from falling down, but from not getting up. But sometimes you want to lie down for a little bit, look at the stars in the sky or the ones flying around your head, and reevaluate your life choices. All right, let's try this again. Now, what was it that Bruce Lee once said? Be formless, shapeless, like water. Well, in this case, given how slow and hard it is to move in this game, I feel less like water and more like... Porridge. There are only two reliable moves you can use in this first fight, depending on the situation. Cartwheel attack and hope you don't get whipped, or keep low kicking him until he passes out and gets a fractured shin. I can't believe this is the third fighting game in a row where experimenting with different moves and strategies is punished, and you're forced to fight dirty by spamming certain tactics to win. Next, you're facing an angry chef with meat cleavers because her daughter said hello to you. I find cartwheeling him to death is the best approach where you take the least damage. Once you take out half of his health, he casually takes it outside into an alleyway and... Really? Two against one? But don't panic, just keep cartwheeling and they'll both be down. After several minutes- After a couple of fights, you'll be thrown into the bonus level where you train by striking targets. This is useful as it can help increase your blue gauge. What does this gauge do exactly? Once you've hit the third fight, hopefully you'll have enough energy to switch to different styles. Once you hit the second threshold, you can switch to the fighter stance. I can't recall ever having to use this stance in the game except for the aerial kick that makes laser beam noises. There's not really much point in the fighter stance because this gauge can decrease as you use a different stance over time outside of your original form, or from getting hit. Do yourself a favor, save as much blue energy as possible because the third stance allows you to use your most powerful weapon, the nunchaku. This baby will take a considerable amount of health off of your opponent and send them flying, but use the nunchuck sparingly you'll need them for certain battles, and whatever you do, don't lose a life. Otherwise, your blue gauge goes back to the bottom, where you have to work for that powerful form all over again. Once you've lost all three lives, you're not greeted with a continue screen, but instead the atmosphere darkens and you say hello to tonight's nightmare fuel. The demon that's been on the hunt for Bruce Lee appears briefly to put you out of your misery but not after standing menacingly for a couple of seconds to scare the player out of their wits, and then smacking them silly with a spear. Oh, and you have very little health. This is a cruel, unforgiving, and downright chilling fight to survive. It's the game's way of saying, you want to use a continue? You'll have to earn that continue. If you can survive this fight for what feels like the longest 40 seconds of your life, the demon disappears and you regain your three lives. 
Have fun facing most enemies now, because after breezing a fight with Johnny Sun, you're in for another two-on-one battle against ladies with sticks. Even with the nunchucks, the fight is a pain because sometimes you'll thrash them or they'll play Brucey in the middle and beat you to a pulp. This level is infuriating. It's difficult enough getting a move in against one of them. You're mashing buttons, hoping that you can get out of a tight spot and you don't lose your nunchaku in the process. I'm trying so hard to maintain my porridgey form, never mind water. I am now gelato ice cream that's melting in the sun. I'm starting to get sloppy and I'm losing my cool. Keep them at bay with your nunchucks. Or if you run out of gauge, you can stoop to their level, or even lower, and get spamming with those low kicks. Hey, do you like rematches? You get to fight the same guy from the third level, and you beat him in the same way that you did before. Johnny Sun also makes a return, but you've got to beat him in 60 seconds. You know, like in the movie. If you don't have nunchucks at this point, you're gonna have trouble. The next two battles are a bit more lenient. You fight a relative of Johnny's son in an ice factory. During this fight, I learned a move you could use when you knock down the opposition. You can jump above them, and if you time it right, press down on the D-pad, and you can stomp them, and feel their ribs crunch under the weight of your foot. Mm. After you fight against a man who blows sand at you and flails his claw around, you finally go head-to-head -head in a final showdown with the demon himself. And his fight is ridiculous. Just try to get close to him. He'll keep prodding you with his long range and inflicting a ludicrous amount of damage on you. Your gauge doesn't drop during the fight, but you'll lose a considerable amount of it if you lose a life. So, how do you beat this guy? Get two things. One, your nunchaku, and two, Lucky. Walk to him and start mashing that button before he can lay a hit on you and hope that he doesn't interrupt you. Then when his health is at zero, you hold the direction towards your opponent, hit the button to grab, and finish the job. Yeah! <sighs> I've done it. I've finally done it. I've beaten Dragon the Bruce Lee story. And it's an absolute mess. Cheap tactics, opponents that almost read every move, outnumbering and sometimes outgunning you with no balanced gameplay whatsoever. This doesn't feel like I'm playing as an awesome master of Jeet Kune Do. The only art this game teaches me is spamming to win. There's also an option to play this game cooperatively with a friend. Two Bruces fighting in the story mode? You'd think this would make things easier, but get this. Once you beat the computer, both players have to duke it out until there's only one standing, and the defeated player loses one of their lives! Eventually one player, if not both of them, will end up getting game over! Right, I've had enough of this nonsense, off it goes in the bin with the rest of them! I've had enough of these sodding fighters! No, no more, I'm off to get some fresh air! Okay. So, here's a thought. Throughout those three games, you're put in a less favourable position. Sometimes a player is dealt a bad hand and they have to work with it, adapting to the opposition who is stronger and may often use a dirty trick or two. Games can sometimes throw obstacles at you that we would deem as unfair, but when you defeat an opponent who has a clear handicap over you, you can gain some sort of satisfaction from beating even some of the worst games. I guess you could say the same thing about some parts of life. And maybe that's what these fighters prepare us for. Testing our resilience in the face of adversity and lack of fairness. And if we can triumph over those sorts of games, then maybe we can overcome life's challenges just the same. Nah, I'm probably looking too deeply into this. I'll probably just play a better game that's actually enjoy it. Hang on a minute. What's this? Oh boy. Alright. Which one of you is next? Round two. Fight. 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 Fight.